Welcome back, fam. Tonight, we have some special guests. Bad Vibes Storytelling, Jensen, and As the Raven Dreams. They're here to collab with me for some true horror stories. Please enjoy. This story is not about a ghost or an encounter with a creepy stranger. It's not even about a near-death experience or something like that. As a matter of fact, I was never in danger during the event. Nonetheless, it's a disturbing memory that I will carry with me until the day I die. I grew up in a small city, the kind of place you could barely call a town if it wasn't for the sheer number of people living there. Downtown was only a couple of blocks long, and in the middle of it was one of the biggest buildings in the area. It was the local movie theater, named after the city. I remember going there when I was very young, about seven years old, and watching the first Pokemon movie. It was probably nothing compared to the theaters we have nowadays, but back then it was huge for me. I loved it. So when a few years later I heard the cinema was going out of business, I felt sad about it. The building was sold to a religious group that used it for their services. You know the type. Loud music, big crowds with their arms in the air singing prayers, some having seizures on stage while the pastor yells through a mic. Every time I walked past the old cinema, I would see the announcements of the congregation where the movie posters would have been, and if they were in session, you could hear them singing from the other side of the street. This group owned the cinema for nearly a decade, until the local government bought back the building in order to restore it as a historic landmark of the city. When this happened, I was studying construction with the intent to follow architecture or civil engineering at college, and my class was very lucky to be involved with the cinema's restoration project because two of our teachers were architects were working on it. I will always remember the day we went to visit the old cinema. Our class was small, only a handful of students, but we were all around the same age, so we all shared childhood memories of when the cinema was operational. We ran through the corridors of the auditorium, sat in the chairs just like we did when we were little kids, and began stomping on the wooden floor with our feet, filling the entire room with the echoes of our drumming and our laughter. A little ritual, of sorts, everyone used to do right before the beginning of the movie. Once nostalgia time was over, we went back to the purpose of the trip, and began to survey the building. We were very excited because that was a unique opportunity to go into the places we would have never been allowed to otherwise, so we made sure to check every corner, every single room, no matter how far, no matter how obscure. The first one we found was below the stage. On one of the corners there was a little door, not very visible, probably because it was meant for maintenance staff only. Behind it we found a long room filled with rusty boilers, part of the old heating system that was no longer in use. The place was a little creepy, with all of those old tanks and pipes crowding the narrow space, but what we found past them was what really started to freak us out. This room was small, very small. It was, after all, basically just leftover space behind the boilers, yet it contrasted so much with the rest of the area around it. It may as well have been from a different place altogether. The walls were painted a light color, white, I think, but I don't remember it very well because what really got my attention were the drawings in them. There were rainbows, a smiling sun, trees and flowers, and happy little people with smiles on their faces of dotted eyes. It was a daycare. The whole class and the teacher gathered to see the discovery. We were all very confused about the strange placing of the room. Okay. We could understand the need for a place to keep the kids that were too little to be amongst the crowd during prayers, or maybe the ones of the people who worked there, but the placing was just... odd. The stage was probably one of the loudest places in the auditorium during the services, and this was right below it, so there was no way it could be a quiet place for the children. We left the boiler room and continued our tour through the theater. A little puzzled about our finding, but not giving it too much thought. Outside of the auditorium, there were the bathrooms, both in terrible condition. The ticket sales booth and a huge set of stairs that led to a mezzanine 
in the auditorium. Half the seats there were totally ruined due to a water leak in the roof, and I cursed these people for not taking proper care of the building. With that part done, all that was left was the projection room on the third floor. Behind the tickets booth, there was a door that led to a spiral stair. I don't remember how tall it actually was, but it must have been over 10 meters of metallic steps without a single resting spot. I wasn't exactly an athlete, but I could walk several kilometers with no problem and rode on a bike to and from school every single day. Yet by the time I reached the top of the stairs, I was exhausted, and I wasn't the only one. All my classmates complained about how hard it was to walk up there. After a short break to catch our breath, we moved on to explore the third floor. It was roughly a narrow passageway with a couple of divisions to form different rooms, but it was more than enough for what it was made for. The first room from the stairs was a storage deposit, probably where they kept the movies and other equipment, and except for some trash it was mostly empty. The second room was the one we were all excited to see, the projector room. The old machine was so big that it was still there, and there were even some pieces scattered around. It was quite a piece of history, and we were all very thrilled to check it out, so no one really bothered to move on to the very last room until we were about to leave. And there, we saw it again. There was a train in this one instead of a rainbow. Something was written on it, in big, colorful letters. Something about Christ. I can't remember it well. The drawings were a bit old, the paint slightly peeled from the walls, but the colors were just as cheerful as you would expect for a place where children play. My heart sank to my stomach as I came to the realization of what that place really was, the one behind the boilers probably serving the same purpose. I took notice of how isolated that room was, literally the furthest away you could possibly get from everyone else. I thought about the three floors of stairs and imagined what it would have been like to a child to walk all the way up, only to end up in that room, the room with the colorful train in the wall. My classmates and I exchanged horrified expressions, as I knew they were thinking the same. We never visited the theater again, even though we continued with the restoration project for several months, and we never talked about those two rooms. Cases of molestation in the church are well known by everyone, to the point that the pedo priest is practically a cliché. But this is the kind of thing you think happens in some place far away, in another city, even in another country. You never imagine it can happen in the very same town you live, the place where you grew up, in the very same building where you once watched a Pokemon movie when you were seven years old. I should mention that I previously lived in a tiny town, but went to high school in a considerably larger city. I never had a reason or the nerve to go out in the city on my own, so when my two friends wanted to hang around town, I was nervous to say the least. However, I thought, what the hell, I'll be with them. We had a blast for a couple of hours after school, with some small scary incidents along the way including walking through a store full of expensive statues and gemstones with a massive backpack protruding from my back, and the original restaurant we wanted to go to was closed, forcing us to go to Subway. However, as it got dark, we all knew we had to go home, so we all enjoyed one last store and went on our separate way. I waited outside the store alone, in the dark, not terribly afraid, yet... I had told my mother where to find me, but she's hopeless with directions, so I had expected to be hanging around for a while. I noticed a news camera stationed outside the store, which made me feel even safer. But about ten minutes into the wait, I was approached by two men. My memory is fuzzy due to how freaked out I was, but this is what I remember. Hey, do you know where... the name of the town that I can't remember is. I shook my head. I was already nervous because I'm a paranoid person on the best of days, 
and this was not turning out to be the best of days. Come on, one man coaxed. Listen, we'll give you a bag of jewelry if you help us, the other man said. Now, I was genuinely freaked out. I glanced around and noticed the news cameras and stepped a little closer to the line of sight of the lens. L listen, I stammered trying really hard not to stammer or show how freaked out I was. I think it's that way, and I don't need anything, I said, pointing in a random ass direction. They glanced in the direction of my finger. They glanced back. Can you show us? Again, we have a bag of jewelry. It felt as if my heart leaped into my throat. No, no thank you, and my mom is coming to get me. I declined as calmly as I could. They stared at me for a few seconds, then nodded, thanking me and headed off in the direction I pointed. I kept well in the line of sight of the news camera until my mother picked me up. I didn't fully relax for a full week. I have absolutely no idea why they were so eager to give me that bag of jewelry. My first thought was that they stole it and wanted to throw the police off their trail by handing some of it off to me. The second was that they were trying to lure me away with the jewelry. Either way, it wouldn't have ended well for me, if that was their goal. No one believed me, but I didn't expect them to. Not really. I have never felt comfortable in the city, alone in the dark, ever since. Even though it's been two years, and I now live in a decently sized city for college. I would like to share with you an experience I had about 10 years ago, give or take. I learned several years after this incident what happened to me is what doctors call sleep paralysis. I said they're full of shit. It really happened. I do not use drugs outside of caffeine and nicotine. I do not drink alcohol of any sort. So this was not a hallucination caused by either of the two nor do I have any mental issues that I know of. Let's make that clear. Going back about a year before this incident, at that time, I was really into ghost hunting shows. I watched and recorded any and every show I could find that was about a team of ghost hunters investigating haunted places. Some were good, others just sucked. No disrespect. I remember watching an episode of... Wait... In order to post on here, I can't use any real names, places, or addresses. Okay, let's see if I can do this. I remember watching the show where the lead hunter guy is a muscle-bound jerk who don't like bullies, but in turn is one himself. He orders his crew around like he owns them, and they follow him blindly, like sheep. I think you know the one. It's a good show, at least it used to be. Anyway, they were investigating... Oh shit, here we go again. They were investigating a bar owned by an old country singer, located in one of the southern states, who wrote a semi-popular song about a girl. Everyone in the paranormal community says this place is truly haunted. Okay, now since that shit's over with, back to the story. They were down in the basement, I think. It's been a while since I've seen it, and to this day is the only episode of that show I will never watch again. They were talking with some guy about what goes on there, when up in the left top corner of the screen, there appeared a shadow figure wearing a cowboy hat standing in the doorway. At this time in the show, they stopped the film and pointed out that when they were down there, they didn't see this figure and only discovered it while reviewing the footage. I was naive back then, and didn't really know much about the paranormal. I figured it's a TV show. What harm could it really do? Boy, was I wrong. I now know that ghosts, entities, or whatever you want to call them, can follow you home from places and are made up of energy and can travel through any energy source they want, and one did. Now that I've given you the backstory to this story, let's proceed with the reason I'm writing this. Many years before this incident, an old friend of mine, back when I was 11 or 12, whom I met through playing baseball in the same team. Anyway, 
He had recently bought a house and was looking for someone to just give his old trailer slash mobile home to, which is where this incident happened. We had lost contact over the years, but unbeknownst to me, he had kept in contact with my father. My father gave him my number. He called me up and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. A free trailer, just pay lot rent. Oh hell yeah, I'll take it. The trailer was old and needed work but it was a good deal. I moved in, did some minor repairs, and a couple of weeks after that, I invited my father and stepmother over for dinner. My stepmother is what she calls an old soul. She can sense when things are not right with the universe. She took one look at the place and said, There's bad juju here. I don't like it. Every time she came to visit, she was nervous. She wouldn't sit still always looking down the hallway. She eventually stopped coming. She said it was too thick for her, whatever that meant. I just thought she was nuts. I know now she's not. I lived there for many years, had some strange things happen, seeing apparitions out of the corner of my eye, voices, cold breezes. I just chalked it up to bad lighting, outside noises, insulation issues, some rational explanation until that night. The night that changed my whole belief systems forever. The night I will never forget. I was lying in bed, asleep on my back, like I always do, when I woke up and noticed a black figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. The hallway light was on. I always leave it on, in case I need to make a bathroom run late at night. The light from behind the figure showed it had a head, two arms, and two legs, but no eyes. It was just standing there. I blinked a couple times to make sure I was seeing what I was seeing, and sure enough I was. Only this time, when I looked at it, it was wearing a cowboy hat. The moment I realized that, I physically saw it jump from the standing position in the doorway over the top of the bed and land on top of me. My body became stiff, unable to move. Out of my peripheral vision, I could see my wife lying next to me. I tried to scream, but nothing came out. I saw the figure sitting on top of me. It reached its hands down into my chest and started squeezing my lungs. I couldn't breathe. It was squeezing the life right out of me. There I was gasping for air paralyzed and unable to make a sound. Just when I thought I was about to die, a series of intensely bright white lights started flashing all around the room, like a strobe light on steroids. I closed my eyes to shield them from the lights. It was that bright. Suddenly, my body jerked a couple times like a convulsion and then stopped. I opened my eyes and it was gone. I was able to breathe again. I lied there, heavy breathing for a good 20 minutes, too scared to move. When I finally got the nerve to try, I slowly moved my right hand over to my nightstand, still shaking from fear. I grabbed my phone to check the time, like I always do when I wake up in the middle of the night. The time was 3.48 a.m., the witching hour. I did not go back to sleep that night. I cautiously got out of bed so not to wake up my wife and turn down every light in the house, every single one, including all the bedroom lights. How my wife stayed sleeping, I do not know, but thankfully, she did. I made a pot of coffee, grabbed my Bible, and sat at the dining room table, drinking coffee. Bible in hand until the morning came. I must have smoked at least a pack and a half of cigarettes in that three-hour span of time. I'm good with that. I'm still alive. I asked my wife if she had seen or heard anything strange the night before. She said no, and I left it at that. I didn't tell her what had happened, and I still haven't. She probably wouldn't believe me anyway. My wife and I stayed at the trailer for about two months after that. When we got the opportunity to rent an actual house, we took it. We packed all our things and moved out. On the last day we were ever at that trailer, my wife had left the vacuum in the back bedroom where this experience happened. 
She asked if I would go get said vacuum, and I agreed. Upon entering the room, a weird sense of dread fell over me, and something inside of me told me I needed to get out of there, and quick. I grabbed the vacuum, ran down the hallway and out the front door as fast as I could, slamming the door behind me. I then turned around and yelled, You want this place? You can have it. I'm gone. My wife looked at me like I lost my mind. My father and stepmother helped us move, along with some friends. My stepmother insisted that we drive all the vehicles that contained our belongings over bodies of water to block any of the bad juju from coming with us to the new house. We did, and have had no bad experiences in our new house, aside from a few bad dreams I had the first couple of nights we were there, about the trailer, but that was it. Well, that's my story. I don't really care if you believe me or not. I know for a fact, it really happened. I live in an old apartment building. I've been here for about two years and my roommate and I have had very few scary experiences so far, except for this one that happened last summer. It was around four in the morning when we were woken from a dead sleep by the fire alarms going off throughout our entire four-story apartment building seeing as this place is occupied mostly by seniors, who figured someone had left a pot on the stove again. I grumbled and blindly grabbed for a blanket, last time we had a false alarm. I was left shivering and barefoot on the sidewalk waiting for the fire department, and I wasn't about to let that happen again. My roommate and I put our shoes on, I grabbed my phone and keys, and we poked our head out into the hallway. Nothing seemed off. The hall was empty, no one else had come out of their apartments, yet. Reluctantly, my roommate and I walked down the hall towards the lobby. We figured our neighbors would soon follow suit. It was only when we went through the lobby and out the front door that we realized something was wrong. A handful of people who had already come out of the building were running and shouting about how the building was on fire this time. We followed them around to the side of the building as more and more people fled in their pajamas and to our horror, we saw an apartment on the top floor belching out flames. People were frantic, searching for water, a ladder, anything. Someone remarked that there was a lady who lived in the apartment who had mobility issues, and she needed to be rescued. Now, and where the hell was the fire department? My roommate was quite disturbed by the whole scene, so we decided to go back to the front of the building, away from the fire. On our way, we saw a guy jump off his balcony to the ground. He rolled when he landed, but I think it still really hurt, judging from how he sat on the grass and groaned for a while. He was lucky to only be on the second floor. There was chaos, yelling, screaming, an odd mix of panic and disinterest, especially amongst the senior citizens who didn't want to leave the building because using the stairs was so difficult. The fire department arrived much quicker than they ever had before, seeing as this was a real emergency, and it wasn't long before elderly ladies in nightgowns were being rescued via ladders and wheeled off to the hospital next door. At one point, the man who lived below the apartment on fire had a screaming episode at one of the landlords, the one that looked like a walking skeleton with an oxygen tank and a scooter. By the time the fire department got everything under control, it was around 6 or 7 a.m. The sun was up, and the people were beginning their morning commute. The fire department had blocked off our whole street, which must have been a pain, and the entire population of my building sat on the curb in pajamas and blankets. Little kids, old people, broke college kids, the works. The community really pulled together that morning. The public bus service gave us a couple of buses to sit and warm up in, instead of standing around on the chilly sidewalk. Paramedics handed out blankets and assessed injuries. The people in the surrounding houses were kind enough to bring us water and snacks. One lady brought a serving tray with mugs of tea from her own kitchen and offered it to anyone she could find. My mum came down to rescue my roommate and I, even though she lived an hour outside of town and hadn't even showered yet. She brought us breakfast and a change of clothes as we didn't know when we'd be allowed to go back into the building. The most disturbing details of what had just taken place that morning came to us 
as we were waiting on the bus. Everyone was talking about the fire, of course, but one man had a particularly horrifying detail to add. He had heard through the grapevine that the lady whose apartment caught fire never made it out of the building. Sadly, we suspected as much, with her mobility issues and all. But there was more. The firefighters apparently found her in the hall. She had made it out of her apartment, but couldn't escape the smoke. Whether she died from smoke inhalation or from burns, we aren't sure. But one thing that man said that sticks with me is that someone said that as they stood outside and watched the flames, they heard the woman screaming, Help me! I'm burning! I've always been afraid of burning to death and the idea that my neighbor may have had such a horrifying end is deeply disturbing. I know the man who lived below her heard her screaming. He wouldn't stop talking about it. I think he ended up with a form of PTSD from this event, and I don't blame him. We were all brought to a community center where the fire department and emergency response volunteers helped bring some clarity to the situation and told us what to expect. Everyone was very kind and sympathetic to us, Whatever we needed, they provided for us. I think all of that is pretty standard procedure. But still, I was extremely thankful to the kindness of the volunteers, firefighters, paramedics, and Good Samaritans. It was pretty surreal to be in a situation like that. We had almost nothing on us. My roommate hadn't thought to grab her phone, so she had to borrow mine to let her family know she was okay. We had no money, no ID, None of the essentials, and we had no idea how long we would be homeless. I hadn't been so happy to have my mom with me in a long time. I felt like a scared little girl, even if I didn't show it. We were lucky. The fire happened on the opposite end of the building from us. Our unit was totally unaffected, and we were one of the few allowed back into our apartment the same day. The building stunk of smoke for weeks even though the fire took place on the fourth floor in a single apartment. The damage was extensive. Even on the ground floor, the walls were blackened with ash. When they attempted to start fixing up the building, they found asbestos in the walls. A few people were forced to move out of their apartments, and were talking people who had lived there for around 30 years. I remember the night we were allowed back into our apartment. I wanted to box up my most important possessions, and keep them in my car, as if I thought the building was going to catch fire again. My home didn't feel safe anymore, and it wouldn't for several weeks. It would take a long time for us to hear anything about what caused the fire. Last I heard, a space heater was to blame, but I don't know for sure. In the days that followed, the fire was featured on the front page of the local paper. The family that lived just down the hall from us were featured in the picture. The article spelled out details that I had already heard. It labeled the guy that lived below the fire as a hero for attempting to save the lady upstairs. It was a valiant effort, but there was nothing he could have done without endangering himself. I feel sorry for him, and I often wonder if the guilt keeps him up at night. Sometimes I think about the lady who passed away in this building. I listen to a lot of ghost stories, so I wonder if her spirit haunts this place. Her sudden and horrifying death would be the sort of thing to make a ghost linger on Earth, wouldn't it? So many things left unfinished. Regardless, I hope she's at peace and I hope that my neighbors have been able to find some semblance of peace as well. Four months later, we've regained a sense of normalcy. Things are back to how they were before, if you ignore the orange tarps around the side of the exterior. The restoration vans that come and go every day and the security guards stationed in the lobby. The damaged wing is still closed while they try to sort out the asbestos situation. But for those of us who live on the other end of the building, things are relatively normal. I hope they stay that way. When I was younger, I'd go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one-floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage, and I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. And let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. 
Now during the time, I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there even when I was with someone. I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell. She said she would be right back, even though she knew how I felt about being down there alone. But I nodded and said okay. She was gone and I was alone, and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and didn't want to, even though the lights were on. Now this is where everything started happening, and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker, and I started to hear noises, and what sounded like talking, and it was not coming from upstairs, but from inside the storage room. I heard someone say my name. Here is the part that freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma. I was confused as hell. How am I hearing her when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving towards the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling came. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide. Go home. Somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. I couldn't hear anything but faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped, and the lights turned back on in the basement, and I felt a little bit better with the lights back on. But the downside, I could see a little in the storage room. I saw a small clown doll in the storage room, and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why is there a clown doll? I have no damn idea. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out, and the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch my grandma looking at me and asking if I was okay. I have no idea if that was real or a dream, but sure as hell felt real. So, a couple of days ago, my boyfriend and I were driving up his road that's in the middle of the woods, and as we turned a corner, we first saw the deer. The deer didn't even flinch at our car coming up the road which was very weird. Then we saw it. Now, I'm not normally a scared person, but seeing this thing made me piss myself. It looked as if this thing was talking to the deer. It had to be at least eight feet tall, very thin, and it had all black wings. It flew right up in front of the car, and my boyfriend slammed on the brakes, turns to me, and says, Tell me you saw that and asked me to describe it to him as to make sure he wasn't going crazy. I did, and we sped all the way home. This all happened in about a minute, although it felt a lot longer. I was telling my dad about it, and he saw the same exact creature years earlier at my sister's bus stop. He tried to convince my sister it was a garbage bag or something, but my sister's response was, Daddy, that thing was too fast and too big to be a trash bag and all my dad could say was I don't know. If anyone has any idea what this could be, it would be appreciated in the comment. I'm very skeptical about this, and I'm looking for a more logical explanation. So my dad is from Kentucky, and that's where most of his family still lives. But we moved to Ohio before I was even born, and that's where we currently live. We used to visit his family a few times a year since as far back as I can even remember. I say used to because I haven't gone in almost 10 years. I'm 25 now. The long rides to Kentucky were always so boring. I had a Sony Walkman that I would try to listen to on the way, but my dad's hillbilly singing overpowered even the highest volume on the damn thing, so most of the trip was as horrible as you can imagine. The one thing I always looked forward to was getting to hang out with my cousin Jay. He was exactly one year younger than me, literally born on the same day. He was just as easy to get along with, 
there was never that awkward, hey, how have you been moment where you have to adjust being around someone again. We always picked up right where we left off, no matter how long it had been. Once we made it into Kentucky, we would always meet at our grandparents' house. Most of the family would already be there waiting for us when they knew we were coming. I always remember everything happening pretty much the same way every time, at least on the first day. We would usually stay the whole weekend, and that Friday we would spend the night at our grandparents. All the parents would stay up late in the kitchen, drinking and playing cards. The younger kids would sit in the living room and watch cartoons with Grandma. Me and Jay, and our other younger cousin Robbie, stayed in the back room. I guess it could have been considered a second living room, but we always just called it the back room. We would always try to stay up late and watch scary movies. I don't know why, but it seemed like we ended up watching the same movie every time. I don't remember the name, but I clearly remember one certain scene. Some monk-looking guy is in a jail cell, and he ends up squeezing his head between the bars. I can't tell you why that scene sticks out more than the others. It's not like it terrified me or anything. Anyways, moving on. Saturdays were always up in the air. Sometimes we'd visit other family members. Other times we would go shopping at the malls and stores. This particular Saturday was different than the usual. All of the adults decided they wanted to go gamble, so our grandma agreed to stay and watch over us for the day. The only people left in the house were me, Jay, Robbie, Grandma, and Great Grandma. There's a reason why I haven't brought my Great Grandma up yet. That's because I honestly didn't know much about her. What I did know was enough to make me not want to know. She was very sick, and she had been for many years. At a younger age, I guess I was just too scared to ask what was wrong. I only remember the times when family members would rush into her room when she needed something. She was too weak to get out of bed, so the god-awful zombie-like moans is what got everybody's attention. Her room was right down the hall from the living room, the first door on the right. She never left that room, and unless she needed attended to, nobody went in there. At least that's what it seemed like. As if she was a caged monster being kept quarantined from the rest of the family. And from some of the stories I would overhear, I could understand something wasn't right. Stories of how her room would drop in temperature out of nowhere, or how her bed would shake uncontrollably. Sometimes she would talk to herself in a language that no one else could understand. Once again, hearing all this at a young age, of course, I thought it was terrifying, but I never put much more thought into it. Anyways, back to that Saturday. All the adults had just left to go do whatever. Me, Jay, and Robbie were in the living room playing the Sega. Our grandma said she needed to get some laundry done and went down into the basement. I can't recall what game we were playing, but I remember it was only two-player, so one of us always had to wait for our turn. While I was on the couch waiting for my turn, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I looked down the hall and noticed our great-grandma's door was cracked open a bit. I quickly looked back at the TV trying to ignore all reasons on why her door would be opened, even just a little. Then something else caught my eye, and almost as if I was being forced to, I looked. Through the crack in the door, I could see her, just standing there hunched over a bit and staring at me. The fact that I've never locked eyes with her before was probably what scared me the most. I slowly turned back towards Jay and Robbie, who could definitely tell that my mood had changed. Robbie asked what was wrong, and all I could say was, she's looking at us. Right away, they both jumped to their feet and peeked their heads around the corner. Then Robbie blurted out, she probably needs help, as he started to rush out of the room toward the basement. Jay and I stood there in silence, not really sure what to do. We tried to ease the tension by joking with each other, but that was cut short when we heard her door slowly creak open a bit more. Then she slid her old, bony hand through the crack and motioned for me to come toward the room. To this day, I honestly don't know why I didn't just wait. I guess I felt like if I didn't go, and something bad happened, it would be my fault somehow. So, I nervously made my way into the hallway and right outside her door. I could feel my heart beating faster. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely move them. I looked back at Jay, and he was giving me this look, like he should have just said goodbye to me while he still had the chance. Then, her door opened slowly, but all the way. She was still hunched over, clinging to the wall, and looking up at me. It was the first time I had ever been this close to her, so I was not prepared for what I saw. She had whitish gray hair that was long in some spots, and shorter in other spots but completely bald in a lot of other spots. Her skin was wrinkled, but looked almost as if it was melting together. She had color in one eye, and the other was completely white. I don't know how well it was hiding it, but I was horrified. If the sight wasn't bad enough, 
She was also making these deep scratch-like noises every time she took a breath. Then she started mumbling something softly. I couldn't hear, so I tilt my head down closer to her and try to hear her better. The deep breathing stopped, and I heard what sounded like a raspy laughter coming from her. Confused, I pulled my head back only to see her stoned face evil stare right at me. For a second, I swear there was a yellow tint in her colored eye. Her mouth moved, it was definitely her talking, but it didn't sound like it was coming from her body. It was deep and sinister, and sounded like it was coming from the ceiling. Get the hell out of my house. I will never forget those words. I turned around and saw Jay in the hall, who clearly heard what I did. His mouth was wide open, and he looked like fear just slapped the hell out of him. At the same time, our grandma came rushing through the kitchen and right past me into the room. Jay, Robbie, and I sat in the living room as we heard grandma shut the door, and the room went silent. It must have been a good ten minutes before our grandma came back out and sat down in the living room with us. I was the one to break the silence by telling her what had just happened. She became emotional as she went on to tell us everything that had happened to my great-grandma, how she only became ill after this house was bought. I guess great-grandma warned grandma about the house. Apparently when the house was for sale, and they were looking at it, great-grandma heard the voice of who she said was Satan, and he told her to get out of the house. So she tried everything she could to turn grandma away from buying the house, but in the end, she bought it anyway. Then great-grandma became very sick and had to move in, knowing it was seemingly cursed. She blamed this house for her sickness every day, but grandma said she was just losing her mind, until the not-so-normal stuff started happening. Grandma didn't seem like someone who would make something up to try and scare us, especially if it was about her own mother. It made me think if that's why things were the way they always were, why nobody ever went into her room, and why she never came out to see anybody. It was also a lot to take in, and most of it I didn't really understand yet. So I asked her why great-grandma would tell me to get out. What did I do? Grandma looked at me with the most serious look she has ever given to me and said, What you heard in there wasn't her. I've heard it too. It's something else. The look in her eyes, the tone in her voice, I'll never forget her telling me that. Even to this day, when I think back, I can clearly hear her voice as if it was for the first time. After leaving that weekend, we found out about halfway through the week that great-grandma had passed away. Although I wasn't close to her, it hit me in a very different way, a dark way. I felt as if it wasn't just old age or her sickness, but something a lot more insidious. My story may not be as interesting as a lot of other people's stories, but it's important to me, and honestly, it's an event that changed my life, probably even saved it. For some backstory, when I was 23, I married the love of my life and honestly thought that my life was set. She was the one person that had always been there with me through all of my hardships. She lifted me up when I was down, and she encouraged me to live my dreams of being a financial advisor. I know, not the most exciting dream job. I enrolled in classes to actually start down the path of being a financial advisor. A lot of really boring math classes and classes about investing, etc. I got a job as a teller at a bank. It was easy and the hours worked out for my classes. Through all this, she always pushed me to keep going. She knew it was what I wanted to do for a living, and she's always encouraged it. I worked my ass off for our future, and I pretty much put in all the time I could physically manage. Because of this, I was always mentally drained between working with people all day and doing classwork all night. I was never really up to doing anything. Then, one night in July, I had gotten home late and was, as stated, absolutely exhausted. When I got home, I fell onto the couch and basically passed out. About an hour or so, she woke me from my afternoon nap and asked me if I wanted her to get something for us to eat, since she hadn't had the chance to make dinner and I clearly wasn't going to. I told her that was fine and that I could go for Taco Bell. She agreed, told me she loved me, gave me a quick kiss, and said she'd be back in 20 minutes. I smiled and shut my eyes again. I dozed off for a few minutes, and when I woke up, I looked at my watch. It had been around 40 minutes since she left. I was confused, but not overly concerned. Maybe traffic had been bad, maybe there was construction somewhere along the way. I pulled out my phone and called her, but she didn't answer. Again, I thought maybe she was driving and just didn't want to be on her phone, so I thought nothing of it. I got up from the couch, went to the restroom, did a few other things to occupy about 10 or 15 minutes, then I called her again. This time someone answered, but it wasn't my wife. Honestly, 
a lot of details are a bit foggy, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but I remember being told that she had been in an accident, and I remember pretty much just being told that she died on impact. Apparently, some drunk driver had run the red light while she was leaving the Taco Bell and T-boned the driver's side. He lived, albeit with some fairly severe injuries, but she was gone. This obviously was the most devastating thing that had ever happened to me. I was able to take some time off work, and I managed to get some time off school because of what had happened. But no amount of time off is ever enough to help when you lose someone like this. I remember sitting at home and just staring at the ceiling one night, thinking about how unfair it was that the guy that killed her got to live, and I just remember crying in rage. That was the night that I started drinking heavily, and the first night that I'd ever blacked out. It's almost ironic, a drunk driver is the reason she died, yet I turned to drinking to drown out my problems. I did this on and off for a month or two. I ended up not going back to class, and ended up losing my job because I missed too many days of work from being hungover. I pretty much just paid the rent and the necessary bills to keep my home, and slept all day after that. This went on for a couple weeks, blacking out, waking up, lying in bed staring at the ceiling, getting drunk, rinse, repeat. Then, after about two weeks of this, I woke up from one of my drunken stupors to what I thought was someone shaking me. I remember feeling like someone had put their hand on me and pushed me, but when I jumped up, there was no one there. After my mini panic attack, I laid back on the bed and closed my eyes, and that's when I heard her voice. I remember distinctly that I heard my wife's voice telling me that I needed to stop before I killed myself. It was honestly as clear as the last night that I saw her, when I heard it. I felt like my heart had stopped and my stomach muscles tensed. She didn't say anything more, and she didn't have to. I knew right then and there that I was ruining everything that we had ever tried to build, and that she wouldn't have wanted that for me. That was the last night that I drank, the last night that I walled in self-pity, it was just the last night that I did all of that. I woke up and made a promise to myself, and to her, that I was going to turn my life around. From that moment on, I was going to live the best life I could for her. There's not a super happy ending to the story, unfortunately. It's been about two years now, and I've been sober since. It wasn't easy to stop drinking, and it wasn't easy to force myself to keep going, but I did it for her. That night, I believe that she saw what I was doing to myself, and she saw where I was going to end up, so she came to me one last time to get me to stop. I never went back to school, which was probably a dumb thing to do, but I'm back to working at a bank, and I'm happy with where I am. If she hadn't come to me that night, I probably would have ended up drinking myself to death. So, a while back I was using Tinder. After I had recently ended a really awful relationship, I matched with a guy who seemed more serious, which was definitely down my alley. We matched and started talking. He was pretty sweet at first, which was a huge relief from my verbally abusive ex. Pretty soon after matching, we started talking on the phone, because I love phone calls, and it calmed down my anxiety at nights. That's when things went downhill. In messages, he was really nice, but once we switched to the phone calls, warning signs started popping up. He seemed very full of himself, talking about how he knows he's such a great guy, and that any woman would be happy to have him. He told me a lot of his personal life too, and I was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. We continued talking, but after a while, I just lost interest. Some of his more undesirable traits just bothered me because they remind me of some things my ex used to say. After a couple of fights over the phone, I just told him we weren't compatible, and I didn't think I wanted to go on a date. He texted me saying how stupid I was for this, and how he thought we had a real connection. I didn't text back because I thought that would be the last message. I thought that that would be okay, to just say I just wasn't feeling it, since I wasn't super serious yet. But oh boy, was I wrong. He started spamming me with calls every day. I'm talking 20, at least a day. And even called me from another number that I didn't even know he had. I stupidly picked up and once I heard his voice, I hung up. He was really starting to scare me. He texted me saying something along the lines of, Really? You hate me so much you can't even talk to me? I told him to leave me alone one last time. And he told me it was my loss. He claimed he was going to delete my number, but I blocked both of the numbers he had had. Fast forward to now. now, I get a message on Facebook from the said dude. Somehow he'd found me and the message read, Remember me, sweetheart? 
I immediately blocked him out of fear. Maybe I'm overreacting. I don't know. But to the guy who wouldn't stop harassing me after I refused to go on a date, let's not meet. My best friend and I went to Walmart one day to get groceries for her mom. We walk in and start grabbing produce on the list when I notice a strange man standing right by the front door and staring. It gave me the creeps, but overall I thought he was just a weird man. I live in Southern California, and they're everywhere. About six foot three, Hispanic and wearing a duck sweatshirt. As I was grabbing some potatoes, he comes uncomfortably close to me and looks at potatoes. I walk away and go to my friend who was about 20 feet away from me. I still don't mention this man to my friend, because I thought he just had no clue of keeping a good social distance between people. We finally made our way to the soup aisle at the end and here he comes walking down the aisle, right in between me and my best friend to look at chicken broth. I tell my friend we need to go and grab other things and we leave the aisle and I give her the rundown on how I believe this man is following me. She agrees that she's seen him and feels weird energy around him. We head over to the tampon section because my friend needed some. I'm standing at our card and she's squatting down on the ground when the man comes up and squats right next to her, looking at pads and tampons. This made us feel extremely awkward, so we left immediately and went to the back of the store to see if he was actually stalking us. We noticed that in his basket he had nothing but a bottle of Sprite. Yet, he's been down so many food aisles with us that he should have grabbed something if he was just a normal shopper. We wait about five minutes in the back of Walmart, where we start to walk to the front and we see him walking the opposite way and peering down to each and every aisle. Once he sees us, he stops and just pretending to look at something on an aisle while keeping eye contact on us. My friend and I went to the makeup section. If you know uh, get a Walmart, you know it's blocked with only one way in and one way out, with lots of cameras. We go in here and look out through one of the aisles to see if he's still searching for us. We start to kind of freak out because both of us aren't the strongest girls, and I know that he can probably take us if it came down to that. We decide to hurry up and get in line to check out. I was talking to my best friend facing away from the cashier. When he gets in line right behind us, she did the most ballsy thing I've ever seen her do and told him off. She was saying how he was following us and that went down every aisle we did, and he only has a sprite in his basket. Soon after, he scurriedly walks away, which still made us feel uneasy. We didn't know if he'd be waiting outside for us, or have him and some friends ready to get us. We went to a worker and told them to keep their eye out for this guy. After we check out, we quickly make our way to the car, with my friend's taser ready to zap. We made it back safe to the car and didn't see him since our interaction. Hopefully, I never meet this guy again. When I was 13 years old, my family was robbed by my mom's ex-best friend. Before robbing us, they had broke in multiple times. One time, they left the front door open, and another, my mom opened the laundry room door. And as she did, the back door closed. Having these experiences, we changed the locks and made sure we locked the doors at night and armed the home alarm. The following year, the events in the story happened. For context, my family lived in a very bad area. People had been robbed and some people had been assaulted or jumped, my brother included. My father is a truck driver, so my mother, brother, and I were usually home alone. My mom is someone who really enjoys watching the ID channel on TV. In fact, my town was once featured on one of the ID channel shows. Our town has such a high crime rate that a human trafficking ring was busted, and my mom's ex-best friend knew someone that was actually busted. The city I live in is the most dangerous in our country. And just yesterday, we drove past the car dump. Earlier in this year, we had had to call the cops twice. Once because we heard someone in the backyard, and another time because we heard gunshots. One night, my brother was asleep in the living room, and I was in my room. My mother was in her bedroom. 
I was on my phone at 1 a.m. because insomnia sucks. Suddenly, I heard the doorbell being rung frantically. My mom's a light sleeper, so she got up and went to the front door. She looked through the peephole of the door. I had walked out and she was standing there on her tiptoes at the front door. She was speaking to this guy behind the door. I heard a muffled guy's voice say, My car's broken down. I need you to use your phone. My mom cleverly replied, I'm sorry, I don't have a phone. She grabbed her phone after saying that. The man insisted and tried to open the door. He then got angry because the door was locked and started shouting. I went to my brother and woke him up. I told him to be quiet and we ran to the bathroom. My mom eventually joined us. We hid in the bathroom together and held on to each other. It felt like a lifetime in that bathroom. My mother was on the phone with 911 the entire time. I was making sure my brother remained quiet. When my mom told us that the cops were there, she made sure that when she heard them knocking, it was them. She gave them a statement. I couldn't hear it all because my brother and I were in the bathroom together. My mom told us that we could get out and I immediately called my dad in tears. He answered and I was crying so hard that my dad couldn't understand me, so I gave the phone to my mom. A while later, the cops came back and told my mother that they had got the guy and he didn't even have a car. His intentions were probably to break in and rob us, or worse. So my city is under the state of emergency because of the whole COVID situation. And the streets are fairly dead, especially late at night, even though I live on a busy street. I was taking my dog out to go pee around 4.30 in the morning. Our backyard isn't fenced, so I basically take her out on a walk around the house. But when I get to the driveway, I saw a man on the side of the road just standing there facing my direction. He was wearing all black with a hoodie and a hood up because that's the creepiest thing you can do. So, of course, right? Anyway, I brush it off and just want my dog to pee quick so I can get inside. My dog is super reactive and she doesn't notice him because she's too busy sniffing out where to pee. But then this guy starts snapping, like over and over again, snapping his fingers. Thankfully, my dog was still preoccupied, but I wasn't about to wait around for this weirdo to pull anything. So I turned around and walked back up my driveway. He's still snapping, but I swear, I hear him walking. I wasn't about to turn around to find out. I just booked it up the back steps and into my house. I told my roommate, and we were both pretty freaked out and started checking out all the windows, but he was nowhere to be found. My dog's been on guard since coming inside. She's running from the front door to the back door. If I ever get snapped out again, I'm moving out. This happened two summers ago. While I was house sitting out in California for an older couple, I had met at a conference for work. It seemed like a dream scenario. The couple wanted to vacation in Hawaii for two weeks, but didn't want to board their cats. I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again because I loved it so much the first time I had went. We figured we could mutually benefit if I came to house sit for them. I flew out there and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to take care of the cats, two of them. One was extremely shy and I barely saw, which is important later. Also, their plants and gave me access to their house and cars. These people were so generous. Before I knew it, I had dropped them off at the airport and was on my own. At first, it was really a dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and taking trips into San Fran, Sonoma, Monterey. In the morning, I could walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the pass surrounding the nearby Mountain Diablo and was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there. 
then one day, about halfway through the final week there, when I got back to the house, I felt really odd. Almost like I shouldn't go inside. I shook it off and went inside anyway, because it was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt, and I made some food for myself, went to bed, and was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time I had even seen her up close. The entire time I had been there up to this point, she never left the host's bedroom, unless I wasn't around. Again, I ignored feeling weird, and just assumed that she decided I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door that night though. I also remember that halfway through the night that I heard someone walking around the gravel outside my window. But after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and I went back to sleep. The day after in the morning, I still felt a little odd, but kept up with my plans for the day. I drove to a little music festival in Sonoma and went clothes shopping and had an overall great day. When I got home to the house though, I found the front door locked in a way I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower, second lock. And that's the only lock my key worked on, so I never messed with the deadbolt. But it was definitely locked. So I had to call my host to find a hide a key, which, safety wise, was buried a whole foot underneath a bush outside and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time. So I used that, went inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did. But with a different door. This time, I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink. And when I turned around to go back in the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door. But I was still pretty unnerved. My own cats are whack, so I think in my mind, I was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out of the house, but I was coming up empty. I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked and just wrote it off and started triple checking the locks when I went out of the house or into the garage. That night when I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, but again, I just locked my bedroom door and went to sleep. The next morning, I felt awful, nausea, body ache. I had no desire to leave the house, so I decided to stay in for Netflix for a day. The vacation stay was like a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in any hurry to get all my touristy things in anyways. But as the day went on, I started to feel that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into a feeling of being watched. After mid-afternoon, I got to the point that I was so uneasy that, even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple of food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach. And as I started to leave the checkout, the cashier said the generic, Have a great evening. I just instantly started crying, shocking myself and the poor cashier. Because I just had this thought that this might be the last person to ever say that to me. When I got to my car, I was still crying and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I could not though, because I didn't want to neglect the cats. So I drove back, parked in the driveway, and convinced myself, after about a half an hour, to just go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would be able to get over it and be able to at least go in and feed the cats and then maybe I'd go stay at a hotel room after. But my body physically would not let me go inside. It was like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house and say I already called the police and that they were on their way. In panic logic, I figured that, that would make anyone leave the house. So I faced inside the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and did just that. The second I finished saying, They're almost here. If you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in the host room turned on, and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to my car and called the police for real. I proceeded to leave and have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. 
Once they got there, they checked the entire house and didn't find anyone. But the double doors in my host's bedroom were left wide open. And there's a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds. So they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken. And that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see in the living room as I stayed home sick. To explain this, the house was an L shape. And from the windows into the garden that were in my host bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. They said they could not prove that anyone was there. There was no sign of forced entry, and we couldn't get hold of the host immediately to verify if anything had been taken. So they said that they would patrol a bit, but nothing else. The shy cat was right back in the host bedroom, and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. So basically, I think the intruder had been there for at least two days, forcing the cat to choose between two strangers and leading her to choose the one that was least strained, which was me. It messed me up pretty bad, especially because they didn't catch the person and I still had to stay in the house over the next three days. Nothing else odd happened and I didn't feel like anything was off for the rest of the time I was there. But the damage was done. I never felt completely safe in that house without doing a complete search before bedtime, but I'm extremely glad my gut spoke up. I guess I'd rather have some residual anxiety than be dead.